that's the practice. That's how you do critical rhetoric. If you're being objective, you're not being critical. So explain critical theory to me because I don't understand. Yeah. That, that when you said you can't ask an objective question about critical theory, that kind of caught me off guard. Yeah. Well, I dig it. I teach critical thinking. Um, and one of the things that's really important about understanding what it means to be any subject at all, any version of an I, is to realize that perspective is going to inform that very, very intrinsically. Where you sit and who you are fundamentally informs questions of what's possible. And, you know, between you and me, this table between us is pretty solid, but neutrinos are flying through the thing like it doesn't even exist. So is it real or not is a question of the arrangement of our molecules. And at what point, like we don't even touch the table, they say. Our atoms just say, no, we're not going any closer. Um, and that's a very subjective thing. That's a very, very subjective thing. And Sweeney Madison's book, I think, is really great on this because she's like, as far as objectivity, this is me trying to translate, as far as objectivity is concerned, when we look at ob objectivity from a subjective space, we're going to define that as what is true for almost all of us? What is true for almost all of us? What do we see that is, like, if I throw a rock at your face and you throw a rock at my face, are we both upset about this? That You, you know, like, those kinds of questions can be asked. But that cannot be the whole story because um, what is true to some of us is arguably just as real. What does it mean to throw a rock at someone? That's a very different question than what's it feel like to get hit by one. And one of the metaphors I use a lot is as an old punk rocker and heavy metal fan, I've been kicked in the face in a mosh pit. And the fact that someone doesn't mean to do it matters. That definitely matters, but not a lot. Like the objective truth of my face being hit, that's important. And I definitely see that. And that's really key. Um, but at the same time, if they're doing that on purpose, and that's just how they like to be in the mosh pit, and those people exist, I know them, um, and I reject them, um, that's terrible. That's doing damage. That's harmful. That is a way of being with consequence that cannot be seen from the boot hitting the nose perspective. That's a question of ideology. That's a question of intent or, um, if you want, lack of care or just recklessness even, you know? And here Kenneth Burke is really important where he's like this imagined dimension of culture is absurd in a lot of ways, but it's very real. It's very, very real. Something that's true for me will be not true for you, and we're both right about that. We're definitely both right about that but our consequences will not be the same. And that's really meaningful. And so for Madison, Sweeney Madison says, the only way we can really understand human reality is to get the objective and the subjective at the same time. We have to get both at the same time. If you're just doing one part of the story, then you're never going to understand the perspective-based questions that are defining that story. And so as a critical theorist, Everyone's like, they're just navel-gazing. They're just talking about whiteness all the time. And um, we're very prepared for that uh, argument. It's a very predictable way of dismissing theory. But at the end of the day, if you do the reading, definitely not. It's not what we're doing. That's what peer review is about, is if someone is like, you know, one of the examples in Star Wars is like um, <laughs> Princess Leia has this really traumatic opening and everyone fixates on Luke Skywalker, right? I think this is a question of sexism. Other people are like, it's just the, the camera looking at Luke Skywalker. That's a kind of subjective question. Make sense? When we go looking at the kinds of questions women ask in movies and whether they know the answer to that question. In Men in Black, Tommy Lee Jones asks a lot of questions, but he knows the answer to every question he's asking. And he's the only one in the room that does, which makes his question very performative. It's a showboating thing. You know, like, do you have any idea what Foucault would say about this, Nick? And if you do, great. And if not, shame on you. You're whatever. He's showboating. He's being a jerk. And yet when women ask questions, they just fundamentally do not know. What is that? What's going on? What do we do? Like these questions are structurally ignorant. And his questions are structurally empowering. That's not an, a subjective question. That is, I tell students, can you put a balcony here? Yes or no. That is a structural question. And we're doing necessarily, if we're doing our job well in critical rhetoric, we're trying to do both of those things. We're trying to ask standpoint questions from a position of who we are as a scholar and to connect them to broader questions of structure. We're trying to take the personal and explain how it is political.
And if you can make that connection, that is critical theory. If it's just, here's what I think about this, that's nice, but that's not critical theory. And so if we're talking critical theory, we're talking structures of ideology. Structures of ideology can't be objective. I've strayed so far from your question, Nick. I'm trying to walk my way back. Am I making any progress here? A little bit. I'm still, I'm still a little confused. I understand the connection that might be there for critical theory because my understanding of that is pretty limited. Yeah. But for critical thinking in that realm, mm. isn't objectivity the, the sole purpose of that? Isn't that how you find these objective truths and That's... understand how you truly feel is by taking an objective? I mean, once you let a subjective view come into that, are you? Yeah. How, how do you quarrel with that? Here's a good example I use a lot, and it impacts me here in Humboldt County quite a bit, including this morning. <laughs> when my feet are really cold and I put them under lukewarm water, it hurts hurts feels hot the temperature of that water not high but my nerves because they are about degrees of difference the way sense is made is always about gradation and if you're at low grade and we leap to high grade we're gonna say that that's gonna get us some gain <laughs> it's gonna get us a peak and we don't like it and um what is pain and how does it work is a fascinating question for you know, sense making. And I did a little of that a long time ago when I was at the U of O. And um, I think to answer your question, do all, is it all we want to know that like the temperature of the water or does it matter to know like, well, what temperature was your foot going in and how much did it fluctuate? Both of those are true. And so when I'm, when I'm saying we want to learn critical thinking, I want to know things that impact society. That's what I want to know. If it's um, like, is red real? Yes or no? We can answer that question objectively if we can look at the rods in your eyes and your visual cortex and we can determine if you're colorblind in all of these different ways. What does red mean? How is that not in part of reality? That's a fundamental part of reality. And if all we ever fixate is on the objective, then we're never going to know the whole story of who we are. You know, it's like Kenneth Burke likes to ask the question, how much of what matters to people is the stuff of culture, just culture, mere culture? And he's like, well, it's questions of like, who are you and who am I and what are we doing right now? And why are we doing these things? And what do you have to do tomorrow? And what did you do yesterday? He's like, according to Marx, if you have a frog that hops one way, if you put a different ideology in the frog, it's going to hop a different way. That's the power of ideology. It's going to change the way the frog hops. Does the universe objectively care about ideology? Does not. Does not. The cosmos has no way of rendering ideology. And what makes Marx significant is less his story about class war and all of that. Great. And more his lesson that ideology is fundamentally material and it impacts you at least so far as class is concerned. That seems pretty real. The, the universe has no substance for class, but we sure seem to care, you know? And so if we want to know who we are and what society is and how it's made, we have to know both sides of that question. That's critical thinking. To only look at one side of that question, that's not being critical. That's not doing the critical part. There's a Lowercase critical, which is like the whole picture. I want to get as much of the picture as I can. The biggest version of the truth possible. And then there's what I call the capital C critical, which is like, who has the power in that story? And that is a question of the self as well as the story that we're trying to look at. But don't, don't you think that the aspect of it being critical thinking is predicated on the idea of objectivity? I mean, once once the in subjective some traditions, yeah, right. Wouldn't that yeah, be the in the Enlightenment tradition for sure? But you think the current, or at least your current interpretation, allows for that subjective influence? Because when I hear critical thinking, I think okay, you have to separate yourself from whatever you're looking at and just take this objective stance right. to try to figure out what it is and what it isn't. There's a really cool book written by Antonio Damasio, and it's called Descartes' Error, and it's this idea. And Damasio is a very, very, very famous cognitive theorist. Um, Oliver Sacks is talking on the cover of the book about how important Damasio's work in describing critical theory. And when it comes to critical theory, they talk about how I, that's just a really difficult thing to find in the brain. 
And Descartes sees the self. I think, therefore I am. There's this thing called the cogito, the me that's thinking in there. And what we want to do with enlightenment is get away with or give up everything beyond that I and find just what is connected to that I. And this means turning off all of our feelings and all of our emotions and centering on mere rationality. And we call it mere rationality now because that's a very selective way of looking at the world. And when you look at um, the way that the brain works, at least, I is a loop, and that loop interacts with other loops that are outside the body. So the individual is one way of thinking of the world, and that seems to be where we're sitting with this kind of question. But there's this thing called the individual over here that says that there's no I in the center, and we're all very much interconnected in ways that are hard to see. And that is a fundamentally different way of just asking the question that you're asking about critical thinking. Those are two very different schools of thought. And what I will tell you is that, just based on the research I've done, that model of thinking, the enlightenment model of thinking, where it's like there are hard truths and that's the core of being, matters. It really matters. No one's saying that stuff doesn't matter. Of course it matters. But it cannot answer fundamental questions for us. Another good person I look to on this is a guy named Stephen Toulmin. Uh, and this is argumentation scholarship. Stephen Toulmin was an MIT physicist who decoded Nazi um, like propaganda and war stuff during World War II. And he comes out of World War II uh, really worried about science. Him and Kenneth Burke had this in common. They're both like, whoa, science can do a lot of cool things, but we do terrible things with it sometimes. And I don't like that. And what Toulmin says is that the formal ways of arguing, the formal theory, the hard facts of life so-called that exist are, so far as most people are concerned, pretty true. Can't get around to those. You drop a rock on my foot, it's going to freaking hurt. You turn my nerves off, suddenly it don't. And that's biology, and that's fundamental to who we are. And he's like, great, but what is friendship? When are you in love? Uh, what is a hero? Uh, what do we do with people that don't belong? These are really, really profound questions. And here, there's just no math equation. And if you make one, I'm really, really afraid of you. I'm terrified of who you are because you cannot boil all of those questions down to one way of being. Looking at the way language is structured is another really fascinating way to take this question on. Because... English, in particular, has a kind of famous legacy for being very linear, which means we like to focus on single things and we create hierarchies and orders and things so that we can go top to bottom or front to back and things like that. Other languages are much more event-driven or they can be much more directional. So a student in my class talks about how their language does not have a waterfall. They have a word that describes water falling, mist rising, the kind of fish that can be within that particular area, depending on how deep it is. And there will be the name of the particular thing, which is kind of like what we do. So we have like Multnomah Falls. And um, I gave them that one. And they're like, well, that's kind of interesting because at least there it is. You have the falls, which is like a live kind of thing. And he's like, that's kind of like how it works in our language. And it's for, from a critical thinking standpoint. We can be like, well, there's one way to look at the world, and then there's a bunch of different ways to look at the world. Do we want to fixate on what's true for everyone at the expense of what is true only for some people, meaning large swaths of the world all over the place? I want to do both. And I think that at the end of the day, one of the things that people come back to a lot with critical thinking, it's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be hard, and it's going to be hard for two reasons. Number one, reading is hard. Research is hard. I don't like to cut cards. It's hard. Um, understanding facts is hard, but it's also hard because it's going to ask questions that really destabilize who we think we are. It should. It really should. If you're a white person and you encounter research on whiteness and you get angry, the good news is you are predictable. The bad news is hard learning now. This is some hard learning. Not fun, but, but if you see yourself as white, if your peers see you as white, if the police see you as white, it is really important that you understand what that means and know that getting upset is a predictable part of that. I experienced that. I talk about that in the book. It's fragility. You're taught to be fragile. Movies will reward fragile behavior constantly. Um, 
And I think that that is a fundamental part of who we are. I think that we, that we have to know that. I want to know how that works. <laughs>